welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I am Cindy Maka, the director. November is the month that we celebrate Veterans Day and we try not ever to miss a chance to honor our veterans. One of the ways that we are privileged to do so this month is to feature two veteran pilots who will discuss the perils and challenges and yes, the triumphs of flying multiple missions over Vietnam. The name given to these combat missions to one of the most heavily defended airspace in the world was going downtown. Two pilots who have certainly been there and done that will speak to us today, Colonel Robert Ettinger and Colonel Roy Martin. Okay, thank you. On the screen, you can see an F-4E just dropping 18 500-pound bombs. It's kind of an unusual configuration, and we did that only in, if you're close to the target. <laughs> so it's hard to carry all that. The important thing to realize about the Vietnamese War, many of you were in it, so you understand, but uh, the U.S. was fighting a lot of different wars at the same time. People in Laos, Cambodia, South Vietnam, and North Vietnam. So this is a story about two periods in the war against North Vietnam, which was basically an air war. Unfortunately, at the time, we were fighting two wars, against our enemy in North Vietnam and against the protests and stuff in Washington. So if this is me. My call sign was Baby Huey. Who, some of you remember the comic strip that had the goose born to the two ducks and kept stumbling into things? <laughs> and uh, Roy Speedbrake Martin, and he'll tell you the reason for the Speedbrake call sign. We were both at Yubon Royal T uh, Air Base in Thailand. I was there in October 67 and came home in 68. Uh, Roy was there in 72 and 73 and was there during the last days of the Vietnamese War. So our role uh, in North Vietnam was to stop the flow of supplies and kind of convince the North Vietnamese that it wasn't a good idea to be in this war. Unfortunately, the strategy was to gradually increase the pressure against North Vietnam. And over the years, that proved to be kind of a poor tactic. Um, it gave them plenty of time to reinforce, bring in more supplies, uh, build up their defenses and stuff. Toward the end, when Roy was over there, we started bombing North Vietnam with the B-52s, and in like seven days, the war was over. So if we'd done that in the beginning, seven years would have gotten, gotten done in seven days. Anyway, during this time period, the targeting was controlled by the White House, and uh, this uh, escalation policy didn't work, and uh, some of the guys that flew against uh, Iraq were backseaters flying F-4s in Vietnam, and they knew that that was a poor tactic. So in the uh, war against Iraq, we really rolled out the thunder right at the beginning, and uh, that war was over pretty quick. So here's a, a map of uh, North Vietnam, and you can see the numbers on there. North Vietnam for the air war was divided up into six root packages. Root pack one down there by the DMZ was uh, kind of the responsibility of the, the army. Then two through four uh, were the Navy. The Air Force had five and six A, and the Navy had six B. And that just caused the war to be controlled by different entities in different places. Kind of confused uh, uh, the organization of the effort. So the, the principal players were the F-105, Thunder's Chief, and the F-4 Phantom. I flew the Phantom, and Roy flew the Phantom. It turned out this was a highly uh, defended airspace over North Vietnam and they had an integrated air defense network uh, with uh, radar and advanced communications so that they could talk to each other. 
and they also had a heavy concentration of uh, anti-aircraft artillery and surface-to-air missiles. The uh, surface-to-air missiles were the SA-2. It's kind of embarrassing, but we allowed Russian ships to sail into Haiphong and unload these missiles. And I'll show you a picture of them in a minute, but uh, they would launch against our morning strike at about 10 o'clock, maybe 100 SAMs. And in the afternoon, they'd launch another 100. So can you imagine this bamboo uh, nation of uh, North Vietnam having these sophisticated weapons like this and uh, uh, launching them against us daily? If we'd been able to strike the ships in the harbor, that would have put that, that would fight, kill 100 SAMs in one blow. All right, so here's a, uh, the sort of the weapons they had. This is a uh, quad machine gun. This is a 35 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, 57 millimeter gun, and this is a surface-to-air missile. This thing is like a telephone pole. Costs maybe a million dollars at that time. It's radar-guided. It's almost three feet in diameter, about this big. Weighs 5,000 pounds, had a 400-pound uh, warhead, and could accelerate up to 3.5 Mach number. And there are almost 6,000 of those launched, and uh, 205 of our airplanes were shot down by these missiles. Turns out that's only about 3.5%, but it's still embarrassing to be shot down by a missile. So this is a serviced-air missile site. And uh, you can see the control van kind of in the center, and then there's six actual launchers around the outside, and then the auxiliary buildings where they build up the missiles and uh, moved them in there and housed the troops and stuff. We saw these same sort of missiles in, the, in Iraq uh, also. One of our defenses against these uh, SAMs were a special group of F-5s that were called wild weasels. And uh, I'll talk to them in a minute. Uh, we also had uh, noise jamming pods. Each one of these jamming pods created a strobe on the target, uh, on the radar of the surface air missiles. And uh, so we flew in a, per a very careful floor ship pod formation where each guy was at a different elevation and they looked at the radar, they're at a different azimuth. So each airplane is putting a jamming strobe like this, and uh, the surface air missile SA-2 has one operator that looks at the radar returns in the vertical plane, and another operator who looks at the radar returns in the horizontal plane. So if you have four guys all jamming, there's a wide strobe like this, and a wide strobe on another guy's scope like this, and so they'd each have to put a cursor on the target. Well, if you got four strobes this way and four strobes this way, it's unlikely he's going to be able to get the cursors on both scopes to lock onto the same guy. So that jamming pod was a big help. The other thing we did was fly at least 10,000 feet above the clouds so we could visually acquire the SAMs and then maneuver against them. And I'll talk to that in a second. We had a radar homing and warning system that had a little scope about this big in the, in the uh, cockpit that gave you an azimuth of every radar that was looking at you. And uh, over North Vietnam, it looked like a bicycle wheel with stro strobes in every direction. So we just didn't pay any attention to that particular thing because they were everywhere. But there was one good thing. Uh, when the SAM is getting ready to f launch, they change the pulse recurrent rate of the radar. And that would trigger a signal in our airplanes and give you a launched light or a tone. And then we'd start looking around. <laughs> and, uh, uh, when you could see the SAM and you get, realize it's coming toward you, you'd wait and wait and wait and then when you when it got to kind of close, you would push down and uh, we'd uh, pull up to minus four Gs. The, uh, at first, 
I'd push forward on the stick like that and I'd float up in the seat so much it was kind of difficult to actually achieve minus four G's. And I finally realized I could take my throttle hand, put it against the canopy, and then when I pushed forward I didn't float up. But uh, once you push the airplane down and you saw the SAM kind of, if it was coming after you, it kind of point down, then it would accelerate really fast because it's got the rocket motor still going and it's uh, going pretty fast anyhow. Then you would pull up and then the missile would never have enough energy to turn the corner and come up after you. So it was very easy to defeat the missiles once we figured that out. Later in the war, in my time period, we added a second jamming pod to the airplane, which actually jammed the uplink from the ground site to the surface air missile. So when the missile got close to you, it would not get the signal that's giving it uh, direction. And during my time period, that nine months that I was over there, the, uh, we lost one F-4 to a SAM. But our, we just happened to be on top of the electronic war with our adversaries. They would make changes, we'd make changes, they'd change and we'd have to take a few months to figure it out and then change again. All right, so these wild weasel guys were a flight of four 105s during my time period. Two of them were 105 Gs that had a radar systems operator in the back seat and the other two were 105 Ds single place airplanes. And they would proceed the strike force into North Vietnam by five minutes or so. And then they'd remain kind of trolling for these service air missiles to come up. And uh, when I, all the fighters had left, uh, they would be the last ones out. So they're first in, last out. Uh, they kind of uh, hoped that the service air missiles would come up. Their operators in the back seat could see the, the radar signal and uh, jam it, and he could also fire anti-radiation missiles from their airplane that would home in on the ground sight radar. And later, the ground sights would, uh, when they perceived that you were launching an anti-radiation missile, they'd turn off their radar. And we had uh, an advanced anti-radiation -radi missile, which would remember where that thing came from and still hit the target. But anyway, the two-place airplanes would identify the site, try to figure out the location of the site, and the two single-place airplanes would try to drop bombs on it. Usually uh, cluster bomb units that would hit a wide area and could take out the relatively soft targets of the radar missile launchers. We also had airborne threats. We had MiG-17s, MiG-19s, and MiG-21s. They all had cannons for air-to-air -air gunnery, and uh, the MiG-21s carried heat-seeking missiles. So here's a uh, MiG-17. These uh, were the same airplanes that flew against uh, US F-86s in the Korean War. And this is a MiG-19, and here's a MiG-21. MiG-21 was a Mach 2 airplane, light, high-speed sort of airplane. The uh, MiG tactics were kind of interesting in that they were heavily controlled by the ground control radar, and they were ordered by the ground site when to take off. They were ordered, vectored to the targets, and they were told when, when to engage, when to disengage, when to refire their missiles even. Uh, the most effective defensive tactics for the MiG-17s was to form a circle. And they'd fly around this circle, and if an F-4 came over there with his fangs out, getting ready to shoot down one of those airplanes, the, the trailing MiG would cut across the corner and shoot down the, the F-4. Now, the MiG-17s didn't fly very fast, so that if you kept the speed up about 0.9 Mach, then uh, you didn't have to worry about those guys. They couldn't catch it. So the, one of the rules I'll talk to later is uh, keep your speed up about 0.9 Mach and then you bring your wingman home. Uh, the MiG-21s 
Their tactic was to come out very high. And uh, if you realize, we're, I'll talk to it more in a minute, but we're driving into North Vietnam with maybe 70 airplanes, all trailing smoke. So <laughs> all in a big row. So there's three miles of airplanes coming in, all going to the same place. And the MiG-21s would come out uh, on an opposite heading, higher than we were flying, and fly alongside the whole strike force and then make a 180 degree turn diving at the tail end of the strike force. And uh, the 105s are up front and the F4s, because they also had uh, bombs and air-to-air -air missiles, they were flying in the back. And many times I'd see a, a flash up here that maybe the MiG is uh, lighting the afterburner or jettisoning an external tank and then uh, you, you could follow them around like this. And if you saw them and just turned, or turned your flight, they would just uh, ignore that, pull up, roll over, and uh, strike somebody else in the strike force ahead of us. Some of our tactics, it's amazing, but we actually ended up with about a four to one kill ratio. We did have to live with some tactics which made our success not quite as good in that uh, we had to have a positive visual identification on the enemy aircraft before we could launch a missile at it. The war was so complex with the Air Force in there and the Marines and the Navy all flying over North Vietnam, you could never be sure that somebody you had on the radar was actually a bad guy. So it'd be a shame to have a friendly fire where you thought you were shooting at a MiG but you would shoot down another one of your, uh, uh, another U.S. airplane. We were also restricted against attacking the enemy airfields. It's kind of like the things with the SAMs. There's a boat parked in the harbor with uh, 100 SAMs on it, but it would have been easy to kill by sinking the boat. There's an airfield with uh, 35 MiGs on it, and if you crater that runway, those guys can't participate. So we were, at the time, we weren't allowed to strike the runways in North Vietnam. Incidentally, the runways in North Vietnam are marked exactly like our runways. There's a big four on the end of the runway that says it's heading like ours. We didn't have an AWACS type airplane. We did have airplanes out in the Gulf that would uh, indicate when airplanes were taking off, uh, or uh, MiGs were taking off, and then give you rough vectors to where they were coming from. And they could tell what type of, uh, whether MiG-21s or, or MiG-17s. The F-4s uh, were kind of poorly configured for air-to-air. -air. The early models did not have an internal gun, so you, they relied on missiles. The missiles, in fact, were designed to shoot down enemy bombers and not really designed to attack maneuvering fighters. And we also had some problems when you, actually when you did have a good lock on and got behind the MiGs, the, the radar bouncing off the turbine blades in the back end of the MiG would interfere with the, the Doppler radar and so these uh, Sparrow missiles would not guide uh, close to the target. We also didn't have very w good air-to-air -air training at the time. Later, we got into Top Gun and the Red Flag, which the Air Force is equivalent to Top Gun. Okay, so this talks to the Alpha Strike. Twice a day, the bases in Thailand would uh, get together and uh, have a, a strike in North Vietnam. I called it the Dr. Pepper Air Force because there was a strike at 10, 2, and 4. <laughs> But the four o'clock didn't work very well because if somebody got shot down, it was so late in the day that uh, it, you couldn't mount much of a rescue. Anyway, think about this thing. There's two flights of four wild weasels that come in at the beginning, stay for the whole time you're in North Vietnam, and then come out. There are like 32 eight flights of four 105s, all carrying air-to-ground bombs. There's four flights of uh, F-4s in the air-to-air -air configuration that are a MiG cap, two in the back and two in the front. 
There'd be a pre and post flight air, uh, air reconnaissance. They'd send an RF 4 over to see how well we did. Sometime there'd be a couple of EB 66s that were jamming the area, and uh, it was all supported by tankers, maybe six or eight uh, tankers. So that's about 70 airplanes, all told. And uh, there was no surprise. You know, we always came the same time every day. We came from the same direction. So here's a map of North Vietnam. And you can see the red routes are kind of the normal route from uh, the bases in Thailand, where you fly north. Those blue loops are refueling tracks. And you'd refuel on the way in, fly into over Laos into uh, North Vietnam, attack a target in Hanoi, come off the target, fly back down the reverse route, post-strike refuel, and then fly back and land. You can see that there's also an over water route where you came uh, off to the Gulf and then flew up the Gulf and then came in from the water side. And the blue tracks on this are, uh, are a Navy where they had a carrier out in the middle of the, uh, called it Yankee Station in the Gulf there, and they would launch their strikes and come in from the water side. So here's kind of the timeline. You'd get up about three in the morning, you'd have a quick briefing at the squadron to make sure your, the guys in your flight were there, and then you'd uh, go to the wing briefing, get a weather int and intelligence briefing, and we'd uh, describe what the tar where the target was. Then we have a detailed little briefing for about a half an hour back at the squadron. Go to our life support, get your parachute helmet, all your gear, walk out to the airplane, do a pre-flight, engine start, and about uh, seven o'clock in the morning we'd take off. A flight of fours would join up, take off individually, join up together, fly as a flight of four to the tanker. Actually, uh, they'd also have a spare. So each flight of four would have a spare that would go with you to the tanker. And if, uh, if there was no aborts, then that guy would just turn around and come back and land. They, there's a very careful pattern of refueling where you wanted the number four guy who is on the end of the chain and is maneuvering much more with his power and burning much more gas than the leader, we'd have him refuel last. So we would, uh, the lead would refuel, then number two, then number three, then number four, everybody's full. Then we'd sit over there to the side and wait until five minutes before the time to push off the tanker, go back in and top off lead two, three, and four. And that way, when we left the tanker, the four was the last guy refueled had the most gas. We then head into North Vietnam. When we cross the border into North Vietnam, we'd arm up our missiles and, uh, and the bombs, push into the uh, target. Sometimes the 105s would have one target and the F4s would have another, but they'd all be in the same general area. So there's 70 airplanes flying along in this great mass all going to the same place. Uh, you'd come off the target, kind of regroup, head on back out, do a post-strike refuel. And sometimes uh, the post-strike refuel was just gave you another load of fuel to practice air-to-air -air, uh, gunnery between your own flight there. You'd uh, <laughs> do a dogfight on the way, but simulate a dogfight on the way back. Uh, sometimes you were so tired and uh, you just decided we, would, we wouldn't do that uh, playing around at the end. But it was good practice. At my base at Yuban, there was an Australian uh, group there that were flying F-86Es, which were an excellent simulator for a MiG-17. And often they'd jump us on the way back after the refueling. And so you'd, you'd gone up there, had guys shooting at you, hot, you're sweaty, and all that stuff, and on the way back, suddenly this uh, MiG simulator is attacking you, so you had to go into another big maneuver against him. 
Anyway, you get back on the ground about noon, go to a debriefing, and then uh, hit the bar. <laughs> so that, you know, that's an eight-hour day. Uh, so you couldn't do uh, those back-to-back. -back. So generally, you got the next day off and then flew another one. So again, I mentioned the gradually uh, increasing pressure against North Vietnam, kind of a poor uh, limitation. After a while, there weren't any targets that we could strike that really meant anything because they, uh, in the beginning, they wouldn't let us attack their airfields, they wouldn't let us attack bridges, dams, things like that that really put a hurt on North Vietnam. We're, we're flying 500 miles up there and back. We're heavily relying on refueling, and which was done excellently. We had no problems with refueling. The Strategic Air Command refueling things guys did a great job. We had predictable ingress and egress routes, and as I said, it's kind of the Dr. Pepper uh, war against these heavily defended targets. So I happened to be part of uh, six air crews that were checked out in a brand new TV guided glide bomb. And this is the beginning of terminally guided weapons uh, in, used in the war. Today we have GPS guided bombs. So a bomber can fly over and have maybe 80 independently targeted bombs that are all loaded with GPS coordinates and they drop the bombs and they all go off to different targets. It's a different way of doing things. But in this case, we had uh, a special scope in the F-4 that had a TV screen superimposed on the radar screen. So if you selected the missile mode, you could see what the missile, the bomb, this walleye is looking at. And you know, if you got close enough to identify the target, you could, it had a zoom lens so you kind of, uh, you could zoom in on it. You take your cursor and put it on the target and then the t this edge tracker would guide the bomb to the target. It had one tracker that handled things vertically and another one that handled things uh, horizontally. So if you had a target like a building with a window in the side of it, there was a nice bounded target, that dark window is that would, uh, you could lock on and the missile would figure out where that window was this way and figure out where it was this way and sure enough it would fly right in the window. The warhead on the thing was uh, a shaped charge. Didn't have a whole lot of explosive power but it had these jet slugs of the casing that went off in different directions like a star shaped thing. So it did a lot of damage against soft targets but against hard targets like the Golden Gate Bridge or the Paul Doomer Bridge, which was in downtown Hanoi, the, the, the heavy steel targets it wouldn't touch. I talked to some people last night about a railroad trestle that I attacked in the buffer zone along the border uh, with uh, China. And uh, we dropped these uh, TV guided weapons and one bomb took out this trestle. And it, the, there's a lot of telephone pole type logs that are holding the railroad track up there. And all those were gone. It's just like kindling. There's little matchsticks all over the place. But the two rails were still there. And they kind of hung across the, the canyon like this. And there were ties here and there, you know, across. And I secretly hoped that the North Vietnamese train driver would come along in the morning and not notice the bridge wasn't there and fall in. <laughs> so here's a picture of that TV guided bomb. So in my experience, I ended up flying 100 missions over North Vietnam. You got to come home when you had 100 counters. I was there for nine calendar months. Actually, I, during that nine month period, I uh, had one month back, at, back in the States where I kind of uh, came back to visit the family and I also stopped by Edwards to kind of convince them that I might be a good candidate for the test pilot school, which turned out to be good. 
Anyway, 100 missions over North Vietnam, 30 missions in Laos, and one mission in South Vietnam. <laughs> South Vietnam mission was kind of like that first slide where we had, uh, I was leading four, two flights of four, so there's eight airplanes, and we all had 15 uh, 500 pound bombs were radar vectored over this uh, caisson where the Marines are uh, kind of cut off and uh, we dropped all that ordnance in one pass. So of those 100 missions in North Vietnam, about 50 of them were in the route pack 5 or 6 around Hanoi. We saw service air missiles on every mission up there. And you've heard my story about the surface air missiles. We actually had MiGs about 20, 20 times that were around. I guess four of those engagements were close enough to be considered, you know, I had to maneuver either with or against. As the pace was going, I just realized it was just a matter of time before I was able to shoot down a MiG or they were going to shoot me down. And then all of a sudden, bang, the weather changed. And in that area, there's a monsoon which sits over Thailand, and it rains and bad weather, and then all of a sudden it moves over North Vietnam. And then over North Vietnam it rains and rains for six months, and then it moves back. So uh, that was just a situation where the monsoon came in, and the MiGs didn't come up, and we ended up doing radar bombing and things like that where we didn't get uh, close encounters. Then uh, on April 1st, April Fool's Day in Vietnam, it was really the day after here in the States, but uh, President Johnson stopped bombing North Vietnam. So I had 10 more counters to go, and for me, the war was over, you know, time to get out of here. So I flew 10 more missions as fast as I could at night. Uh, against targets in North Viet the southern part of North Vietnam and came home. So my experience uh, led me to these survival rules. Don't get in a contest with an enemy gun because that guy's going to win every time. If you just keep going back attacking him over and over and over again, eventually he's going to uh, get a hit on you. And then don't try to turn with a MiG because they can turn tighter than we can. Don't go below 9 tenths Mach, and as I said, the MiG-17s can't go that fast, so they can't uh, attack you. The MiG-21s will not turn with you if your speed is up. And the other last one is obviously try not to bail out where the, you just palmed. <laughs> so with that, and I'm going to let Roy take over. The reason uh, Bob has those colored slides is he, had a, he came back to staff position and they learned how to do that as staff officers. But if you're just a token pilot the rest of your career like I was, well, you're just black and white slides as the most you ever get. So that kind of explains the slides here a little bit. Okay, uh, let's now uh, pick it up where Bob left off, 1968. Uh, there had been a major offensive on the part of the North Vietnamese called the Tet Offensive. Bob's uh, job and the guys up there on uh, Operation Rolling Thunder, which is what theirs was called, was to interdict the supplies coming down uh, the trails and uh, coming down through North Vietnam and to blunt that offensive. It was successful. The American troops that were in there at that time did a very good job of blunting the tent offensive. We sent the North Vietnamese uh, home to lick their wounds. Uh, there were now the North Vietnamese were interested in a, a peace negotiation, so they opened the peace talks in Paris and uh, um, they stopped, for us, we stopped bombing North Vietnam. And this is a theme you're gonna hear uh, a little later on again. Uh, so now, we then started a change of president to President Nixon, a new policy called Vietnamization, which was, let's turn the war over to South Vietnam, let's stay in country with airplanes to help with air support, let's help with the training of these people, but we're gonna bring the American forces home and achieve peace with honor. That was the, uh, the intent. So uh, by, night, by, uh, by the next three years, this is what happened. We started pulling our troops out 
And by uh, March of 1972, we only had 10,000 uh, ground troops remaining uh, in country, but we still had air, air, air people and the uh, various air bases to help uh, to support the South Vietnamese Army as they were trying to get trained up. And this would be where things were uh, coming March of, 19, uh, uh, of 1972. However, the North Vietnamese, even though they were talking at the peace talks, they were not scaling down. They were scaling up. And during this whole time, they were moving troops in to completely surround North Viet or South Vietnam all the way from Beam Saigon with troops in Cambodia, troops in Laos. They had 150,000 troops in place, all armed, ready to go. They had 30,000 troops just above the demilitarized zone up in this part of North Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh had a philosophy. You can kill 10 of my men for every one of yours, but in the end, I will win. And he had no qualms about throwing people into the meat grinder to achieve his objective, which was the unification of Vietnam. So, come March, uh, essentially March the 30th, 1972, here they came across the DMZ to make their attack for another offensive. We called it the Easter Offensive because it occurred right at Easter time. And it was no accident that they used this time period because this was the beginning of the monsoon season for South Vietnam, which meant that there would be clouds and rain and therefore the air support for the resistance of this offensive would be stymied, was the intent. But this time they come across this DMZ, they came armed with bear. They had tanks, they had artillery, large artillery pieces, small artillery pieces. They even have SAMs located now in this Route Pack 1, Route Pack 2 area. And this is the beginning of the uh, offensive of uh, March of 1972. Our response, we're going to take them on, we're going to fight, we're going to support South Vietnam, which is what our charter was to do, to try to help that country maintain its independence. Additional planes were flown in from the Far East and the United States to help with the air support. And we did not bring any more U.S. troops in per se. The South Vietnamese Army by now had about uh, two to 300,000 in their army ready to blunt this offensive. So this was beginning an operation we call linebacker. So here was essentially our objectives now to help blunt this offensive. We're going to continue to interdict supplies coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And this was uh, the trail, when you talk about Ho Chi Minh Trails and the interdiction of supplies, that's where we were flying. It was over southern Laos primarily trying to interdict those supplies. In addition, we were going to destroy operations above the DMZ. And we were going to mine the harbors of Haiphong and not let any ships come in to, to do supplies. So this was different than in Bob's era where uh, ships could come and go into Hanoi. No, nope, I mean into Haiphong Harbor. Nope, the, uh, the uh, harbors were mined. It, interestingly, these mines were dropped and set with a three-day fuse that they wouldn't arm for three days. And we told the ships that were in the North Vietnamese Harbor, if you want to leave, you can leave, but three days from now those uh, mines are going to be armed and they're going to go off if you hit one. Uh, in addition, we would resume tactical bombing in North Vietnam, and this would be called uh, Operation Linebacker. So let me introduce a little personal uh, stories now into this. Uh, I graduate as a brand new captain, uh, aircraft commander, brand new aircraft commander on the 9th of May uh, out of McDill, Florida. At the party we're having that night, the TV is turned on, and President Nixon comes on and says, we're mining Haiphong Harbor, we're going back over North Vietnam, we're going to resume the bombing. So the next day, the instructor pilot shook my hand, handed me my diploma and said, good luck, you're going downtown. <laughs> so that was it. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, after a quick uh, run through uh, a jungle school, jungle survivor training in uh, Clark Air Base in the Philippines, then I arrive at Da Nang. I'm assigned to Da Nang Air Base. That was our main primary air base at that time. And I arrived there right at the very end of May of 72. However, um, the North Vietnamese had pushed down and were just north of the Da Nang Air Base. And Da Nang was one of their prime areas, but the South Vietnamese had done a good job of the Arvin, we called them, 
of uh, putting up a resistance so that they wouldn't take Da Nang, but they were within rocket distance of the base. So the North Vietnamese were shooting a lot of rockets into the base, and on the second night I'm there, uh, rockets, so we get a rocket attack, and these rockets weren't guided, they would just shoot them and whatever they hit, they hit. And I had one that landed a couple of hooches over from mine. Uh, it went off, and on the, uh, I was on the second deck of our hooch, but on the ground hooch, uh, next to mine was the AC-119 crew, and they had a navigator laying in his bed. He had his hands, he had his flak vest on. He had his hands over his vest. The rocket went off just outside. The shrapnel came through, came right through his pillow and put his eyes out. So this is an example of uh, how sometimes you can get hurt in these combat arenas like this. Uh, things were hot. We were, those rockets were coming at a regular basis. They said, okay, get the airplanes out of here, out of Da Nang. And so uh, I was reassigned to Ubon, Thailand. And so my first sortie in, in theater was to fly an F-4 from uh, Da Nang over to Ubon, and then I would fight the war out of Ubon from that point on. I didn't mind that at all because Da Nang was hot. You had all these rockets that are going off occasionally. They had crappy food. And when I got to Ubon, I opened the menu. They had mashed potatoes and gravy, and I said, now here's a war I can fight, you know. <laughs> so I was happy to arrive at Ubon. Anyway, um, now, the way it worked uh, as a new guy pilot, you had 10 missions in the south, uh, as we would say, before you would go downtown in the north. And these were warm-up missions to uh, get you used to operating in theater. So most of these missions were either missions over Laos to interdict the supplies, or uh, over the uh, north part of South Vietnam, just below the DMZ. And these were primary missions supported by what we called slow facts, Cessna O2s and OV-10s would be flying around, they would know their area, they would see bad guys or they would see uh, things that needed to be destroyed, and then we would come in as tactical fighter pilots, they would shoot a rocket, say, you know, there, there's where your target is, we would drop our bombs, and those were the kind of missions that were over, uh, uh, the warm-up missions, if you will, and you got 10 of those. Uh, one of the best airplanes on this mission is right there, the, uh, the uh, A-4. It was excellent bombing platform for doing those missions. Uh, Doug Kersky, are you here? Doug, stand up. Doug was a Marine pilot over there when I was there. He was flying A4, A A A4 so there we go. Let's give him a hand, because he was a good. <laughs> good job, Doug. Yeah. Yeah. He'll tell you the A4 was a much better bomber than the F4, and I have to admit he's kind of right on that. Now, the next area, which is a little more threat, would be the Route Pack 1 and 2. Now, remember, they had an awful lot of troops. They had a lot of AAA had been moved in there. They actually had some SAM sites. So the way we handled the bombing in that area was we would supply FASFAC. A FASFAC was a fast fighter type airplane that was acting as a forward air control. And it would go down, try to find the guns, try to find the troops, try to find the various targets. When it found them, it would pop up, ask for tactical fighter support to be brought in. When guys like me carrying the bombs would arrive, they would then dive back down and shoot a smoke rocket, identify where the target was. We would then uh, roll in and, and bomb that particular target. These facts were initially called misty facts in the uh, earlier days using F-100 airplanes. By the time I got there, the, uh, fa these fast facts had converted to F-4s, and if they came out of Ubon during the day, they were called wolf fact, and if they were, came out at night out of Ubon, they were called owl fact. So anyway, so night and day, these facts are trying to interdict the supplies coming down the Route Pack 1, Route Pack 2 area of uh, North Vietnam. Pretty hazardous mission. Let me give you an example. A friend of mine, Lynn High, in our squadron, was a fast fact. He rolls in one day on a target. He asked for tactical support because he thought he saw a, a van that would be a, a SAM guidance van. And uh, there wasn't any tactical fighters available right then. And he kind of had to get to the tanker because he was low on gas. He says, OK, I'm going to roll in. I'm going to strafe this target, maybe put it out of commission, and then I'll head on out. And when he rolled in to strafe the target, it was on the edge of a tree line, and it turned out to be a black trap, as we said. There was a, as he rolled in to, to strafe the target, the guns opened up. Now, a 14.5 millimeter round comes right through his RPM indicator in his cockpit and runs out of energy just as it hits his chest. And the bullet drops down in his arm. Now, he had some extra bullets here in his vest, uh, 
because he had a handgun that if he had to bail out, uh, you know, he wanted some extra bullets. That round hit right where those bullets were, and uh, it hit him so hard, he said it felt like a sledgehammer hitting him in the chest, knocked his wind out, knocked him a little bit woozy. Uh, the back seater, Johnny Wyatt, grabs a stick, pulls the nose up, starts the airplane climb, climb, climbing, and then uh, ran it out of airspeed, but anyway. Uh, uh, but then Lynn comes back, finally good enough to recover the airplane, and they did recover. So these were hazardous missions, and this was not uncommon. One of my squadron commanders did have a bullet come right through and split his helmet. So these were very, very close call activities going on during this kind of bombing. That was the missions down in the south area, and then come the missions over the north, the ones going downtown. Now, linebacker missions were a little different than Rolling Thunder because during this three years that we hadn't been bombing up north, we hadn't just been sitting around, we'd been developing new technologies back here in the United States. And now those two, two technologies are gonna be applied. Now, our targeting was a little different. Bob's was controlled by the White House. Our targets were controlled by the military. So now they had turned, uh, uh, turned over the war to the military, which was a good thing. Our F-4s, a lot of them were equipped uh, with, uh, well, a few of them. We had six of these designators in country called uh, knife pods. I'll talk to those in a minute. But it allowed us to drop laser-guided bombs. And the laser-guided bomb was a game changer because now we had accurate bombing and we could drop them from higher altitude and have a lot more survivable uh, uh, um, capabilities than what it was during Bob's era of Rolling Thunder. We started using chaff a lot so that the tin foil drifting down over North Vietnam would disrupt the SAMs uh, radars that were trying to find us. The F-105s had some new standard arm missiles that had bigger warheads, longer range, and more accurate guidance. So for the SAM suppression 105, it was a better, better missile. We introduced the F-111, and even though they lost three F-111s right off the bat when they first arrived, they turned out being an excellent platform for a low-level ingress into North Vietnam and being able to do single mission and actual survive missions over uh, the Hanoi Haiphong area. And then the Navy, I'll give them a shout out, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but they went home and did their homework and developed new tactics against the MiGs, and they ended up having excellent success against the MiGs. Let me just talk a little bit now about a typical mission. Uh, and so my first mission was for, for going downtown for, was going to be the Hanoi Vehicle Repair Facility, which was a large warehouse complex where they would uh, build these trucks up before they would send them down the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. And uh, uh, on this, just to kind of give you an idea then, we would all come out of different bases. Uh, the chaffers would be out of Ubon, the bomb airplane out of Ubon, the uh, uh, MiG, MiG capper coming out of Udorn, and the uh, escort airplanes are coming out of Atak Lee, and the F-105 uh, anti-radiation uh, wild weasels are coming out of Korat. So all the bases are supplying airplanes, and we all arrive on our tanker, tanker tracks like Bob talked about. And if we were going to go into Hanoi, we would generally hit the tankers that were over uh, Laos, but if we were gonna go into the Haiphong side, we would hit the tankers over the uh, Gulf and then come in from that direction and come out. So now here we are all on the tankers, probably around 48 to 60 uh, F4s and, one, and, and a few couple of, or a few 105s. So when the time comes, the first people to drop off will be the F105s with their escort getting ready to go in if any SAMs come up. Uh, their radar, they're going to be ready. Next group that'll drop off at the same time will be the MiG cap. Now, the, uh, the, uh, you could tell who was who by the call signs because the, uh, an, the F-105s were like birds. They were like Cardinal or Blue Jay. The uh, MiG cap were cars. They were like Chevy Flight, Old Flight. Um, then the we uh, were uh, trees, like Walnut Flight or Oak Flight. So interestingly, when you're listening on the radio, you can kind of somewhat sort out who's doing what to whom by our call signs. Okay, so uh, they, uh, chaffers then start going in. Now, chaffers were F-4s that would be in a spread formation, and they actually had devices on their airplanes that would grind up a tin foil and spit it out in forms of chaff, and they would create a chaff quarter coming right over our area of North Vietnam. 
and that would help to disrupt the SAMs coming up, plus the ECM pods we had that Bob talked about. Now, the chaff mission was really dangerous because it doesn't take a SAM operator uh, a lot of smarts to know that if he's got a chaff quarter, that probably at the very front of that chaff quarter is four F4s. So they would shoot the SAM up into that very front area of the chaff quarter, and they took a lot of SAMs. It was a, it was a hazardous mission, all for laying of chaff. So uh, everybody is in place, so now we, the tactical, the people with the bombs, would uh, drop off the tankers, find that chaff quarter, and start in. Now I want to add one other group, because as soon as everybody would drop off the tankers and start in, immediately somebody would yell, I got a bogey at 12 o'clock. And somebody else would say, don't shoot, it's the Marines. <laughs> because coming out of a base up north, uh, north of Thailand here, at a place called Nam Phong, is the Marines. And they're going to go up and sit right at the border of North Vietnam, and their job is rest cap. If somebody gets shoot, shot down, then they go in as the rescue combat air patrol to, to, to keep people away until the either helicopters or A1Es can come in to pick them up. Now, this was a crappy base. It's said that when the Marines came out of South Vietnam to relocate into Thailand, that they sent a Marine general and they said, hey, we got this strip of land that's in the middle of the jungle, kind of mosquito infested. Well, let's land there, and they do. And he steps off the, the side of the runway, and he said he sinks up to his knees in mud and water, and he says, I think this will be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so they put up tents, and that's where they operated from. Uh, we called it Rose Garden because the song, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, <laughs> is, is why. So that's where the name came from for that. Okay, so now, uh, laser bombs, how did we employ them? The way the laser bomb works is the laser designator puts down a point source of light. It hits the ground. It reflects back in a cone. If you drop your bomb inside that basket or that cone, with enough energy, it'll guide, guide, guide right down to that point source as long as you keep the laser on the target. So the way we would work, we would start inbound. We would be in that pod, pod formation that Bob talked about moving our altitudes a little bit, uh, all spread about 500 feet apart, line abreast. And then when we got close to the target, lead would rock us in. So now we're in a fingertip formation, about three foot wingtip spacing. All four of us, each person has two 2,000 pound bombs. The lead airplane has the laser designator. We're going in at about 15 to 17,000 feet. When lead's ready into afterburner, we start to pop up. The roll in about 20,000 feet, down the chute at about a 45 degree bo uh, a dive bomb here. And at this point now, the lead airplane puts his reticle on the target area. And the uh, pod that you see uh, here, uh, kind of if you can see off the kind of the wing, there's a funny looking uh, thing. Well, that's a laser designator pod. In that pod is a television camera that's on a gimbal. Now that television scene is being piped in to the guy in the back seat of the F4. So when the front seater puts his pipper on the target, the back seater sees the target, puts a little, takes a little hand a designator, puts it over the target, and then unrelease, releases the gimbal and starts tracking the target by hand. He then, when he's got it figured out, he fires the laser and he tells the front seater, I'm lazing, I'm, I'm tracking, I'm tracking. The front seater then puts out a call, walnut flight, pickle, pickle, pickle. And everybody pickles their bombs together and all eight laser guided bombs come down aimed at one point source. And I mean, that was awesome as far as the ability to take targets out. And now the front seater has to start this slow pull out about a 2G pull, keeping everything nice and steady while the back seater is tracking, tracking, tracking until bomb impact and then boom, we spread out, head out, bound as fast as we can for the most part, looking for tankers. Okay, and then once we're on the tanker, then we head home. So now I have to tell a story about myself. How did I get this silly call sign called speed break? On the bottom of the F4 is a little uh, thing called a speed brake. It's a little door that can open up and help slow you down. 
Well, we didn't have chaff dispensers on our airplane. They do now in the modern fighters. So what we would do is take bundles of tin foil, put them in the speed brakes, close the speed brakes, and then never use those speed brakes until we got to the point where we were rolling in on the target and we knew we had to be stable for several seconds here. And if a SAM came up, well, you were gonna be hit. So what we would do is as we rolled out, we would open the speed brakes, out would come all these chaff bundles, and the theory was that it would disrupt a SAM that might be coming up during that time, okay? So I'm doing that, I'm coming off, they did, my first mission, you're pretty amped up, you know. And uh, as we come off the target now and we start to head outbound, uh, I'm getting behind flight, and I'm having to use afterburner to catch up. Now, this bothers me because of the following fact. When I first arrived at Ubon, signed to the 25th Squadron, which was, uh, we were day bombers. Two squadrons would bomb in the day, 25th, 433rd. Two, bomb, two squadrons would bomb at night, the 435th and the 497 Night Owls. So, um, they assign me to the 25th Squadron. I go over to my hooch. I go upstairs to my room. At the room across from me, there was a guy there named Jim McCarty, captain. I go over, hey, how you doing? I'm Roy Martin. He says, uh, hi. Uh, he says, uh, uh, I like to talk, but I got to get some sleep. I got an early get up tomorrow. I have, I'm on a special mission. Special mission man. he was going downtown. So I said, okay, Jim, see you when you get back. Good luck. That was the last I saw of Jim McCarty because the next day he was shot down and killed. And uh, what happened was a MiG, just like Bob, Bob said, when MiG came through the flight, the strike flight had to react, and you got these big old heavy bombs on board, and it was easy to get a little bit slow. Jim McCarty got a little bit slow, he got behind the flight, and then the MiG that's coming out of the weeds to shoot you down, they love people that weren't in the, in the formation that maybe was a little displaced, and Jim uh, got shot down that day. So it was very important to keep up with your flight. So now here I am coming off target, falling behind, and the airplane's vibrating. So what the heck is a vibration? Maybe I got, took a hit or something. But I have to use afterburner to catch up because I don't want to get behind like, you know. And uh, so I thought, maybe it's the wing tanks. So I reach over and I pick all my wing tanks off and the vibration is still there and I'm still in burner. And finally I see a little light that says speed brake open. <laughs> And like, are you kidding me? I put the speed brake in, the airplane smooths right out. So now we go, I catch up with the flight and I no more than catch up and I'm on the wing of uh, Al Munts, great mission commander. So as uh, so I'm just catching up when four, Walnut four says, Walnut flight, we got a MiG at six, he just fired. So big Al says, stay with me two, we're in a right break, back into afterburner, back into like a 6G turn. And then four says, the missile is tumbling, the MiG is separating. So apparently the, the, the missile must have had a fin come off or something, but the missile uh, malfunctioned, the, the Atoll missile that was being shot at us. So now we roll out and, uh, and uh, lead calls for a fuel check and I am really low on gas compared to the other members of the flight. So Big Al calls the uh, tanker and said, Red Cell, you gotta come and get us, I got a guy out of gas. And red tanker, these tankers, they came in to the edge of North Vietnam to get me. So to this day, I love tanker guys, and I'll buy them beer at any time. And we got to the tanker, and the last time I looked as I was completing the rendezvous, I had about two minutes of fuel left in that airplane. So I plugged and got on, and now I'm really upset because, man, I had screwed up. So here we are, I'm coming off the tanker now, we're all coming home to Ubon. My backseater was uh, Steve Baker because they said, hey, let's, the scheduler said, let's put Martin and Baker up on the same airplane. <laughs> well, Martin Baker was the company that built the ejection seat. So that was scheduling humor, if you will. Anyway, uh, Steve says, I want to fly. I said, no, I'll never get to fly again. So this is the last, uh, I, I screwed up. I'm going to get sent home in disgrace. This is, you know, I just, I can't believe I'll go through all this effort. And then I screw up and I, that's it. So we go into a land, we go into debrief. And the first thing Big Al, my flight lead says, so Martin, what happened to all your gas? Uh, Sir, I left my speed brakes out coming off the target. He looks at me and I said, this is it, the end of my career. And he laughs and says, ha, I bet you'll never make that mistake again. <laughs> that's it, I get to go, I'm back flying, yoo-hoo. So that's the thing about combat. If you live through a mistake, you learn from it, Press on.
okay? So uh, that was mission number one. But the bad news is you get stuck with this call, this call sign for the rest of your life. All right, so a little shout out right quick to the, uh, the MIG cap. In Bob's era, the way you fought MIGs was the lead airplane had a wingman and the wingman stayed welded to the lead and the lead got to shoot the missile and the wingman's job was to protect the, uh, the leader. But the Navy went home and said, that doesn't work. We got to do some new tactics. So they studied the MIG, they studied the F-4, and they developed a new tactic they called uh, double attack, or we called it loose deuce, where either airplane could be the lead and the other airplane would be the wingman in a coordinated manner. And that turned out to be super effective in linebacker, and it got to be where I don't think the MIGs wanted to come up and fight Navy fighter pilots because they really had their act together and they were shooting down a lot of MIGs. However, the Air Force didn't set on its butt either. In uh, the Red Crown, which was the call sign for the ship that was out in the water that would put out the calls when the MiGs were airborne, had a limitation in that they couldn't see at low altitude because they were on the surface of the, of the uh, uh, surface. So the Air Force, in an EC-121 uh, old Super Connie, put a radar in the airplane that could look down and kind of became the first version of an AWACS, an Airborne Warning Control System. And this had the ability to look down and see targets on the ground and when they first came up. And their call sign was DISCO. So using DISCO and Red Crown working in concert, the Air Force also had good luck against the MiGs uh, during that. So those were the two uh, technologies that had been developed. Okay, if you will stay with me with one more little war story, then I'll kind of start moving on to linebacker two. Uh, in about September, my roommate, George Latella, uh, is shot down. Uh, he was a lieutenant, back seater, and Colonel Bob Anderson was in his front seat. They were in Oak Flight, uh, number four. They were just north, uh, west of Hanoi. They take a SAM. And George in the back is talking on the radio, Oak 4, we've taken a SAM, we're losing our hydraulics, we're probably going to have to bail out. While he's making that transmission, we know that Colonel Anderson in the front seat bailed him out because while George's hand is on the throttle with the radio, boom, out he goes. He didn't do his own ejection. There was an ability for the front seater to bail the back seater out and then the front seater would go. So when George went out, the canopy bow broke his arm. So now he's got a broken arm, uh, but he, the, the, the parachute works, and we had a little survival radio we kept right here. So when he's coming down the parachute, he gets his survival radio out and he makes this call, Oak 4 Bravo, Oak 4 Bravo, I'm okay, I'm okay, I broke my arm, but I'm okay. The reason he was emphatic like that is for some reason among the group, uh, we got to thinking that there's a direct relationship that if you have to bail out, and you can get the word out that you're okay, then you'll probably appear on a POW list later. Now, so and we always said to ourselves, we're gonna make sure it's, somebody knows we're okay at this particular point. So uh, George gets uh, lands uh, in the middle of a rice paddy, the farmers come and uh, he said they're not happy. And he was pretty sure that they were gonna kill and bury George Latella and you'd never hear from him again. But the North Vietnamese came in and uh, rescued him from the farmers and hauled him off to Hanoi and he became a, a citizen of the Hanoi Hilton for the next few months. His arm, they tried to set up, but it was shattered and the, he didn't get any good medical attention until he came home uh, 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 when the POWs came home. The front seater, Colonel Anderson, never knew what happened. No parachute, no call and his remains were returned in 1998, and it was found that the location where the remains were found were almost identical to where the airplane crashed. So he probably was in the airplane when it crashed. So there was a malfunction somehow in the overall ejection system. So that takes us through now to um, early October, and it's the same thing. We've had a lot of great uh, missions that have blunted the, the supply down to the North Vietnamese. They now have had to retreat back close to the DMZ, so they're losing the Easter offensive, and in the same format that they've always had, they come to the Paris Peace Talks and say, oh, let's talk, let's talk. And we stopped bombing North Vietnam to help these, these peace talks along. And they were pretty serious. 
in their, in their talks. And finally, on uh, 27 October, a treaty was put in place. And Henry Kissinger, our representatives at those talks, announced peace is at hand. So we assumed that's it. The war is over. The war over North Vietnam is over. Uh, and so that's it. And uh, actually, I went on R&R &R at Hawaii and told the wife, well, that was it. Survived the war. And um, um, with some great stories to tell. But um, when I got back on the 15th of October, I got called in by the office officer and said, Martin, you're a FCF pilot. You got a lot of F4s to fly to make sure they're ready to go because we're loading two missiles, two pods. The only time we carried two ECM pods were missions over North Vietnam. And I looked at him like, you're kidding, we're going back? He said, yep, we're going back. The peace talks fell apart, and we're going back to North Vietnam. Now they'd had about 45 days to rearm, new SAMs, new everything, and it's like, you got to be kidding me. So we're brought in on the 9th of 17th of, uh, of uh, December and uh, mass briefing, and they said, okay, you're going to go in, you're going to go directly to your target. There may not be search and rescue. This will be an all-out effort when you land. New, new crew will move it, jump into the airplane. We're going to rearm. It's going to go round-the-clock bombing. And to show that we're serious, the B-52s are going to go into North Vietnam. And we were shocked. B-52s over Hanoi, they're going to die. This was, our, this was our impression. And so it started. So on the night of the 18th of December of 1972 began Operation Linebacker 2, and we called it the 11 Days of Christmas. We didn't bomb on Christmas Day, we went bombing every day. And the primary airplanes that were the most effective, there was a lot of bad weather, so the tactical airplanes were having some problems, and we did some laser bombing, but if bad weather, it would make it kind of difficult. But the B-52s could bomb down through the weather, and they would come in and do the bombing. However, the first night, they took well over 100 SAMs, lost three B-52s. And over the next uh, three nights, 11 B-52s are shot down. And this is a very high loss rate. And they're having very effective tactics against the B-52, who were supposed to have all this great equipment that was supposed to be able to, to not uh, have these SAMs be effective. So what were they doing wrong? They were using strategic air command tactics. Everybody would come in at exactly the same route, exactly the same altitude, one right after another, like ducks in a shooting gallery. When they got over the target and dropped their bombs, they would roll up to this 45 degree bank and turn out on an extended turn. And when they did that, the ECM gear was not effective. It was effective straight down, but when they rolled up, now the SAMs could see them highlight them, shoot at them, and be effective. So these, uh, the other tactic that was being used was they would put a MIG up to see what altitude the B-52s were at, since they were all about the same altitude, and then they would set altitude detonation on the SAM, and then they would just simply shotgun up a bunch of SAMs that would go off at the altitude that the B-52s were at, hoping they would get lucky, and sometimes they did. All right, well, this goes on for about three nights, and the air crew, the B-52 air crew said, wait a minute, what are we doing? Why are we doing this same way all the time, all the B-52s? We need to have random attacks, and we need to come in at different times and different locations and different directions. So, SAC was pretty adamant to maintain the tactics that they had established, but finally, you got to hand it to a guy named General Sullivan, who was a wing commander at Utapau, which is one of the bases where the B-52s were coming out of. He called SAC headquarters, and he didn't really ask him to change tactics. He told him, we're changing tactics. And it cost him a career, but the B saved a lot of lives. Um, he, uh, they did. After that, SAC headquarters said, okay, change your tactics, but do what you got to do, because we can't stand that kind of loss rate. So then, um, they stayed kind of south for the next two nights. We went down for Christmas, and when they come up on the night of the 26th of December, they came in from random attacks with no turns. They would just go over the target and keep on going until they got either from land to feet wet or from the uh, gulf coming in over land. So now they didn't have so much of the turns. They come in different directions, and they tried to coordinate so that they could bunch up and hit their targets at about the same time. 
and they put 115 B-52s at various targets over North Vietnam in 20 minutes. Amazing. And they lost one B-52 that night. They, had, they lost a couple more B-52s until they stopped the bombing on the 29th of uh, December. But the bottom line is they now had a lot better tactics, and that's what they learned. Well, let me show you what this looks like. This video I got is a part of North Vietnam propaganda. I didn't ask the North Vietnamese if I could show it. Um, but it will be a SAM going against a, go, go, going up and you'll see it, it does hit and bring a B-52 down. Pretty quick video, yep, get it. pretty quick video, so be ready. You're gonna see the SAM launch, the impact, and then the remainder. So here we go. Uh, I believe that this is 26 December against that B-52, but this gives you an idea. Now there's the, there's the impact with the B-52. You saw the impact from the B-52 and you saw the parts and pieces of the B-52 coming down, okay? So now, I want you to ride along on a mission, linebacker 2, 26 October, or sorry, 26 December. And this audio will be the courtesy of Paul Metz. Uh, many of you know Paul, uh, test pilot at Northrop Grumman for years and then uh, later on for Lockheed. But he was an F-105 pilot over there during linebacker 2, whose job was SAM suppression. And he had an audio in his, in his, in his cockpit and I just want to play so that you'll understand how intense these missions were. And again, thanks to Paul Metz for this. So here we go. And I'm just going to let it play. It's about two minutes. Sam, watch, hand on eye. Sam, watch, hand on eye. Oh, Jesus. Look at him go. Holy cow. So we've got four of them coming up. Right in that. Here comes some more. Roger. Yeah. Sam, watch, Sam, watch. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and try to get something on it. Triple launch. Okay, I got one going in on it. Sam, watch, Sam, watch, Hanoi. Okay, we got two Sam coming in behind you. Roger. Oh, that one's going to hit the ground. Come on. Sam, watch, Hanoi. Two more coming up on the ground. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and throw the three in on Wow. <laughs> so now you can see how intense it is when you're uh, doing one of these missions. So again, thanks to Paul for that uh, audio, just to give you an idea that uh, there's a lot going on to try to maintain your situational awareness and stay alive during that. So uh, this should be the statistics from Linebacker 2. B-52s did 741 sorties, dropped 15,000 tons of bombs. Tactical aircraft did 1,274 sorties, dropped 5,000 tons. 1,242 SAMs were fired. I don't know how they come up with that number, but that was what was recorded. 
primarily at the B-52s. During the day, we actually didn't uh, get Miriam Sam shot at us as tactical aircraft during the day, but the, saved him for the B-52s. B-52s lost 15 aircraft. 33 air crew were killed, 33 POWs, 26 were rescued. For the tactical aircraft lost, the Air Force lost two F-4s, two F-111s, and 15 B-52s. The Navy lost one F-4, two A-7s, two A-6s, a reconnaissance aircraft, and a helicopter. Ten air crew were killed, eight POW, 27 rescued. At the end of this point, the North Vietnamese were ready to come back to the peace talks, and this time they were serious. And so a uh, ceasefire was declared on 27 January, and the treaty was signed on 28 January, and thus was to be the end of our participation in uh, the war of, uh, over North Vietnam. 591 POWs then came home in February. We still have over 300 missing in action over there. So that concludes the war over North Vietnam. I stayed in theater. We continued operations over Cambodia, but that's the source of another lecture, okay. <laughs> Let me just say from Bob and I, thank you. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for letting us uh, kind of relive uh, probably the most exciting time uh, in our lives. Thank you. Any questions to either one? Sir? The, no the nationality of, the, uh, of those that Mix. were flying the North, Vietnam, the, the North Vietnamese MiGs. The research I have done since then, and we've had communication with those pilots, they said that all the missions were flown by North Vietnamese pilots, but the training was done by Russian pilots, primarily Russian pilots. One guy said that on one mission, a Russian pilot was caught in the air. He was on a training sortie, but that he did not do any participation against the U.S. Uh, during that. But they claim that it was all North Vietnamese pilots. You heard anything different than that? Yeah. So that's what's been claimed since then. So that's the answer to that one, sir. What he's saying is that they did have a... Uh, 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 a get-together of the North Vietnamese pilots and primarily the Navy and U.S. Air Force uh, MIGCAP pilots uh, got together at the carrier Midway in San Diego and in that conversation the North Vietnamese said that they, uh, that they were the pilots of, 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 of the MIG airplanes. Okay, what he said was that the North Vietnamese said that they didn't get to come home from the war because the war was right there, and so they didn't have what we call a D-Rose, a day in which you could leave the war like we did. So they had to fight it all the way to the end, but they have published a book of all the engagements from their perspective, and that that will be published in the future. Question was, why could we not bomb, bomb the MiG bases and the bases that the MiGs were flying out of? Uh, during Bob's year of Rolling Thunder, it was politics, and I don't know why, but there was no uh, ability to do that. During linebacker one, I was always confused myself because the MiGs are coming out of Fukien, uh, uh, Kep Airfield, a GLOM. One day we did get the bomb kept, but that was the only time. Other than that, um, we weren't allowed to bomb the airfields, which had me scratching my head. Linebacker two, that all changed. The B-52s hammered all the air bases including GLOM, the international, uh, international base. Well, yeah, that's, just, that's exactly it. The, the question was, uh, why didn't we bomb the airfields? And basically, it was a po political situation. Uh, in the early part of the war, they didn't want to uh, cause uh, so much damage in North Vietnam that the Russians would come in and support them or the Chinese would come in and support them. So it was kind of a delicate balance. Fight the guys in the streets, but not in, the, in the, their home base. All right, so Bob Johnson says uh, that uh, President Johnson and uh, McNamara were kind of choosing the targets, and uh, there were a lot of military significant targets uh, that uh, we weren't allowed to bomb. and. Uh, so we just, uh, you know, did what we were told. So to elaborate a little bit on dams, uh, they did dam up the primary river, the Red River, uh, Songha River through uh, Hanoi, and they had power plants 
operating on that river. And on linebacker one, we were then directed to bomb the generator next to the dam, but do not break the dam. <laughs> that was our orders. And we did it. And I went in on Viet Tree power plant myself with uh, those similar orders. Question is, was there ever known any Chinese pilots? And uh, I, I can only go by what the North Vietnamese say today, or the Vietnamese say today, that there were only Vietnamese pilots in those airplanes. There we go. So the, co the comment is, there may not have been in the air, but there were Chinese infantry on the ground. Uh, the question was, uh, was there any rogue operations? Uh, I didn't know of any. Uh, we were fragged on a target. We did our best to get to that target. I, I personally don't know of any rogue operations. There was a, a one case where uh, some uh, Air Force F-4s, uh, well, the comment by Bob Johnson was that the movie uh, Flight of the Intruder was pretty true in the way it went, but the idea of rogue pilots bombing North Vietnam was uh, not true. You know, in my case, uh, during the time period I was there, from one of the 104, 105 squadrons, uh, they were coming in over Haiphong, and they got some fire out of some ships in the harbor, and they strafed these ships. And uh, when, they, when the guy came back, when they came back at home, they uh, looked at the gun camera film and destroyed it. And then uh, a huge court martial um, uh, went on, and actually, Chuck Yeager was the chairman of this uh, uh, board. Uh, the wing commander eventually got fired. He wrote a book about it, and uh, it's a pretty well-known situation. But, uh, the, you know, it was frustration uh, b being able to see that these ships, Russian ships, are there and not being able to attack them. So he said that there is a book out now called Dereliction of Duty that talks about the, uh, the era of President Johnson and Defense uh, Secretary Robert McNamara and their, if you read that book, he says you will be very <laughs> frustrated at what we had to go through based on their decisions. And that could well be true. I do not know of any case where the tankers were targeted. Uh, personally. Uh, they, they did stay on the fringes of North Vietnam, but pretty much they stayed in their anchors over Laos and except like in isolated cases like me the dummy when they had to come in and help me out. <laughs> oh yeah, the question was uh, EC-121s, the uh, first versions of AWACS, uh, where did they come out of? And uh, as far as I know, I don't remember which base, I'd have to look it up, but I, I'm pretty sure they came out of one of the Thai bases. Yes, sir. The question was, had either of us been back to Vietnam? And uh, somehow I have no desire to go there, and I haven't been. Uh, I will just add to have I been back to Vietnam, the answer is no. I've been back to Thailand several times. I love Thailand, great food, great people. Uh, but uh, no, I have not been back to uh, Vietnam. The question is, what's the, what are the Red River rats? Mm -hmm. And we're wearing these river rat shirts. Uh, the Red River flows out of China through uh, Hanoi and out through Haiphong. And uh, the early part of the war in the North Vietnam, we decided that it was a special mission to fly north of the Red River. So the real name of the organization is the Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association. And in the early part of the war, the different bases in Thailand all had different tactics. Some guys were coming into the area at low altitude, some were coming fast, some were coming from one side or one, the other and stuff. And finally, we decided we ought to get together and have a conference and figure out what the best tactics were across all of the flyers coming into North Vietnam. And we included the Navy uh, guys, too. And that first tactics conference was the founding of the Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association. During the time I was there, we had three practice reunions, which were tactical conferences at the different bases in Thailand. That continued, and then finally, when the prisoners were released, we had the first real reunion 
in Las Vegas, it and it was a wonderful time. <laughs> uh, then uh, let me talk a little bit more about the river rats and stuff. Um, we realized that many of our wingmen were getting shot down, and then they, there were kids at home that didn't have any fathers. So the river rats decided that they would pay for scholarships for those kids. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional, but uh, for those kids to go to college. And we started off giving scholarships for the kids that were lost in the early part of the Vietnamese War. And the, the, the pilots to qu qualify for that in the beginning had to have flown north of the Red River. And then finally we said, well, we got some money together and it's significant. We ought to cover all of North Vietnam, any place in North Vietnam. And then we decided, let's cover the South Vietnam. And so the scholarship thing has just kept growing and growing. And in Benghazi, there was the, when we went after whatever his name, Miramar, whatever his name was down there, we lost a 111 and we took care of those, those kids. And then there was uh, the uh, thing in the, um, in the Gulf there. Uh, so anyway, every military engagement that took place since then has been covered by the River Rat Scholarship thing. And we've given out over two million. So we've given out over two million dollars in scholarships. Toward the, uh, uh, then after the war, uh, we had the scholarship thing off and running and one of our members uh, became handicapped with Lou Gehrig's disease. And they needed some support. But the way our scholarship thing was funded, we couldn't cover that. So we created another uh, fund thing. It's called the Air Warrior Courage Foundation. And on the federal uh, uh, campaign, it's called uh, Wounded Warrior Support or something like that. Anyway, that thing has now grown to it gives, it receives almost a million dollars every year and we give away a million dollars every year to help returning Vietnam uh, veterans from any service, any place, any time. So, uh, and in fact, you don't even have to be veterans. And there's another scholarship thing that handles peacetime accidents uh, for air crews and stuff. So I think that covers it, pretty good outfit. And uh, we, uh, every year we have a little reunion and stay up late and drink too much. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, no, I just wanna add that uh, that's one of my most pr uh, proud uh, organizations to be a member of is the, the River Rats. And, uh, to the, and the, the good things that the rats have done and are still doing is still out there today. And if you want to learn more about it, you can Google on the River Out uh, organization and it'll tell you more about the foundations and the scholarships that are out there to support the veterans. And the money does directly go, and that's pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.